Welcome everyone. Welcome to Lunch with Team Medical. And my name is Anne Lone Dalhoff. I'm heading up marketing um, for Team Medical. And we know you're all joining. So please just take your time, come in and join us. We are recording, so you'll be able to see anything you missed later. Firstly, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. It is my pleasure, it's an absolute pleasure to spend lunchtime with you today and a bit of housekeeping before I hand over to our speakers. First of all, your cameras and your microphones are turned off and muted but we would love for you to participate because we learn better when we participate. So if you could please open your chat up at the top, there's a chat box. Please open the chat now and let's make sure it works for you. So open it and say a little hello and where you're from. In that way, our team knows that um, it is working. Second thing, as I said, we are recording and we'll share the link by tomorrow with all of you and it will be on the Team Medical Events webpage as well to go back for extra learning. Our speakers will give us a really informative presentation today and we will have a Q&A session at the end. We would love for you to write your questions while they're presenting because we have a team here sitting happy to answer and we're gathering questions so that when we get to Q&A, it's not crickets, but there's actually questions there that I can start sending through to, to Haley and Emma. And thanks for the thumbs up and like, I can see some people already active on, on their keyboards. Yeah, keep them coming. At the end, we have a little survey link and we would love for you to click on that and just take one minute um, to answer a few questions because then we can continue improving our webinars for you and those that join next time. So at Team Medical, we're really committed to quality education. I may just say, so I can see there's a few hands up and everything. If you have any technical issues or questions, put a comment in the chat and the team will message you directly and figure it all out um, behind the scenes. So I really appreciate um, you doing that. So um, we're really committed to providing quality education to support your practice. And today's webinar, Back to Basics and Wound Care in General Practice, is sponsored by our partner, Smith & Nephew. So thank you very much, um, Emma and the team, for making it possible um, today. Our two expert speakers today are Haley Ryan from Wound Rescue and Emma Herschel from Smith & Nephew. Haley has over 20 years of experience in nursing and a passion for healing wounds. Haley is the director of Wound Rescue and the chair on the board for Wounds Australia. Thanks, Haley, for being here today with us. And Emma represents Smith and Nephew as the clinical solutions specialist. With a clinical background in podiatry, Emma has experience managing and supporting prevention of these complex lower limb wounds. Emma is passionate about supporting clinicians through the education and making it evidence-based practice. So today as well, it's about understanding the appropriate use of Smith & Nephew range of wound care products um, to really support you in achieving optimum patient outcomes. I will hand over to Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thank you and hello everyone. Welcome to today. Now, Hayley is going to be navigating the slides for me. So Hayley, could we have the next slide, please? At Smith & Nephew, we understand that wound care is complex. It's not just the consideration of the wound, it's everything around it as well. And I'm sure on the screen now, there are lots of statements that are ticking buttons. And if not some, possibly all of those things are relevant to the complexity of your world. And we appreciate that. So next slide, please, Hayley. What we're here to support you with at Smith & Nephew is simplifying that world. Simplifying it in a way where there's evidence base in the actions you make, giving you the confidence that you've, the product solutions, the protocols, the pathways that we can support you with are all 
strong and effective when it comes to the end game of providing those optimum patient outcomes. So we have a range of things to support you with there, some of which are ev evidenced on this screen that are beyond the product. And Hayley, could you just pass the next one? And to help you position where product types belong, how they can be properly and effectively used. We take you from the acute to the chronic wound with our range of products. We take you from the simple to the complex wounds and everything in between. And we help you approach that in a logical fashion. So on the screen, you've got an example of some of our products and where the positions aligned with what you're trying to achieve with your outcomes. What the wound is telling you, it needs help with. So next slide, please, Hayley. The two products I'm just going to position today are aligned with today's topic around that sort of back to basics, cuts, grazers, minor burns and post-op wounds. So two of the products within our extensive range, we have Opsite post-op. So that is a product which is absorbent. It has an absorbent pad. It's waterproof, shower proof. So it can be worn for an extensive period of time, which we'll come to in a moment, and go in and out of the shower without needing changing. And it's bacteria proof, protecting that wound. So the absorbent wound pads is covered with a reactic waterproof film, which helps manage that moisture vapour transpiration rate, so the sweatiness of the dressing. It stops the bugs getting in its bacteria proof top film. And it can be worn for up to seven days, which of course reduces those dressing changes, the disturbance of the wound, the associated workload and costs as well. We also have Primapore. Now Primapore is an adhesive non-woven wound dressing. So now this isn't a waterproof dressing, but it also has that highly absorbent pad. And it's really great on those areas of high movement where you're getting lots of flexion and extension and movement of the limb. So your elbows and your knees. It has a low allergy adhesive, so there's less chance of reaction to the film by the patient. It's conformable and it's comfortable. So two distinctly different products that can be positioned in the same clinical space and you use the features to help you decide which is appropriate for my patient's needs and the clinical outcome I'm aiming for. And that's where Hayley will lead on with more of that clinical background. Next slide, please, Hayley. So for further support and education, we have a website, close to zero.com.au, and I'm smiling because this is something that I adore. I love this. We have trapped people like Hayley on our system. We have webinars, we have podcasts, we have recorded symposia. We speak to nurses, to surgeons, anyone involved with that wound care journey. We have speed learning modules. You can sort through by topic, wound type, presentation type, expert clinician. And those expert clinicians are people like Haley that are national and international thought leaders and experts that share their knowledge, their involvement with international guidelines, etc. And we are always adding to this. This is free to sign up, so it's www.closetozero.com.au. And once you are registered, that means that you can access these. You can watch and listen. A quick little um, reply at the end that just shows it's a little survey, but it's really to show that you didn't cheat the system. You watch the whole thing and then you get your CPD, uh, CPD certificate with your name on that supports your CPD journey as well. So. Um, there is a lot on there, every wound type imaginable. So enjoy. And next slide, please, Hayley. So that's who we are in a nutshell. We are here to help you with those simplified solutions to address the complex problems, from the simple to the complex, from the acute to the chronic, not just products, but solutions, education, and applying the correct use of products. So thank you for your time. I hope you really enjoy this session with Hayley. I've no doubt you will. And I'll pass over to Hayley. 
Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today in probably what is a very short lunch break for you if you are at work. A big thank you to Team Medical and Smith and & Nephew for the invitation to be here. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we get from injury to recovery. So how I can maybe empower you all in primary care to better support those living with a wound. Quick disclaimer, you're going to see some wound pictures. I always provide that disclaimer, so please be mindful. They can get a little bit graphic. I do want to talk briefly about the economic burden, your scope of practice, managing the skin most importantly. I'll touch on briefly assessment and diagnosis, and what I've been asked to really talk about today is cuts, grazes and minor burns and some potential solutions to the problem. So here's what we know. Around 450,000 people are living with a wound at any one time. It costs the Australian economy around $3 billion to treat, which is 2% of the health expenditure. So we have a major issue on our hands to treat wounds and we are affected. They are affecting a lot of patients. So what do we need to do as clinicians? I will always go back to it is best practice to look at the evidence and then interpret that evidence into your everyday practice. Now, one thing is you are welcome to take photos of my screens today, just not of the patients that I'm going to show you, but feel free to take pictures of the other screens. Here's one of the recommendations I have for you and it's around some key documents. For starters, jump over to the Wounds Australia page and have a look at their standards for wound management. There's also a wonderful document on there called the Application of Aseptic Technique in Wound Dressing Procedure, and it really guides your way about managing in the, in the context of where you work, how you can best get that infection control. The Diabetic Foot uh, Australia also put out a lovely document in 2021 going through how to identify diabetic ulcers and treatment pathways. There are some other um, companies that I'd recommend you contact and that's the European Wound Management Association. You can just Google EWMA. They've got a fantastic document on antimicrobials and what you need to think about in the context of wound healing and dressings. Um, and we're all in that era of AMS, antimicrobial stewardship, so it's really timely to have a look at that document. And hot off the press, you're hearing it first. Uh, we've just released this new document, which we've just finished uh, writing and getting published. And it's about the treatment of lower leg ulcers and how to diagnose them um, accurately. So a couple of things on the screen. Please um, uh, think about getting onto those websites and having a look. So what about your scope of practice? Well, I went to the APNA website and this is what it tells me, that primary care providers provide scientifically sound first level care prioritising those most in need. You also address health inequalities and foster collaboration for public health promotion. So does that sound like you? I'm sure it does. The question is, how do you do this? Well, here's my take on it. You do assess well all of your patients. You certainly collaborate and refer on if needed. And what it really comes down to is education. And I'm referring here to educating our patients so that we can get some of that shared care happening with our patients. So just briefly, I'm gonna to touch on some of the fundamentals whenever you're thinking about a wound that you should consider. And here's the basics, you know, if you take anything from today, and I always show this slide because it is really the foundations of what we do. If you have somebody living with a wound, it is really important that you identify the cause of the wound. How did they get it? Because it really does tell a story. Assess that person holistically. What medications are they on? Uh, what other comorbidities do they have? After that process, you then can move into assessing the wound. And it is crucial that you adjust the wound regime to meet the response. And what I'm referring to here is if you've got a wound that's not showing any signs of healing after two weeks, really consider going back to the top of this and working your way through. The goal of care is also crucial, but this is the patient's goal of care, not our interpretation of the goal of care. So in other words, we're not just talking about a palliative wound here, conservative treatment, What's the patient want to do? Do they just want to get back to bowls on a Saturday, but they're sick of their wound leaking through the dressing? So ask your patients, what do they want to achieve in the next four to six weeks, for example? And of course, it comes down to good infection control. Once you've got those down packed, here are the three key elements that I can guarantee you now will heal every wound. 
good nutrition, good amount of water, and good amounts of oxygen. Now, if you apply these to every wound, you're going to heal them. Now, let's think about reality. We know that not many patients eat well every meal. We know that a lot of people don't like to drink water. And thinking about your patient cohort, how many of them have oxygen issues, whether they have COPD, emphysema, bronchitis, asthma, the list goes on and on. So already we have an issue to heal a wound. So what are some of the foundations that you should think about before you even get to that wound? It's around the skin the largest organ on our body. And here's what we know in our research, that the normal skin pH sits between 4 and 6.5. Yes, it does vary with age. In other words, it sits slightly acidic. The optimal pH that we try to aim for is around 5.5. And the reason is, is because we have a layer on our skin called the acid mantle. And if we protect the acid mantle, we can avoid things like bacteria and breakdown in, in uh, the skin, which cause the wounds. So the practicalities are, do you get a litmus test out and test all the skin for the pH? Absolutely not. But start um, educating your patient about using soap-free cleansers. We don't want them using soap products and things like applying emollients twice a day. And we have gone away from sorbeline. I'm sure you've heard that over the years. It's a cheap product that doesn't really help the skin. So thinking about what other pH neutral emollients you can make as a recommendation to your patients. Just consider the person's skin type as well. And I know that you see everybody from little babies all the way up to the elderly, but their skin type changes. For example, our neonates and our um, really young children, they have a skin thickness of 40 to 60% of adult skin. That means they have a limited surface attachment. And within the first few weeks, the pH falls to 5.5 to actually provide that antimicrobial defense. As we get to middle age, we start to see maturation of hair follicles and sebaceous glands. We get increase in lipid content and we get higher fat content because our body is starting to say we don't want it to dry out. But over the age of around 65, we start to see a 50% decrease in epidermal layer. pH becomes neutral, so less acidic, which means we are more susceptible to bacteria and infections. We get a 1% decrease of collagen every year, which means we start to wrinkle more, and our elastin fibers decrease in size, and that's why we get that dry skin. Think about anyone over the age of 65. How many of them have dry skin? It's a real issue. And they also have less sensation for pain and touch. So back to the foundations, what actually is a wound? Well, we've spent many years educating on the fact that a wound is either an acute wound, a chronic wound or a complex wound. So an acute wound such as a skin tear or post-surgical intervention, a chronic wound between four to six weeks of delayed healing or a complex wound where they may have a disease process like diabetes or they may have an infection. And therefore, these are the three elements that make up a wound. However, we are now moving away from this and we are starting to term, use the terminology hard to heal wounds because this is what we know that doesn't matter whether it's an acute wound, a chronic wound or a complex wound, they can all be hard to heal. And that is why we're changing our wording from chronic wounds to hard to heal. And what that means is you can see on your screen now on the right hand side, that's the normal phases of healing. So you get a wound, it starts to bleed. The natural body response is then to go into that inflammatory phase. It then starts to proliferate as it starts to remodel and build that actual wound back up. And then the final stages is that maturation, which can take many years as you develop scar tissue when the skin really starts to strengthen again. What we know with all three wounds, if they're hard to heal, they get stuck within that inflammation um, part of the, the healing. And that's when we need to start thinking about who may be at risk so that I can make sure I put everything in place before we get to that stagnant stage. So those at risk, those um, that are over the age of 65 and young children, those with comorbidities and depending on their etiology, resources. Think about your cupboards right now at work. How many of you can sit there and say, I've got all the resources I need to put onto a wound? And clinical practice. Do you feel you have the sufficient knowledge to provide that more complex care for wound management?
And of course, you've all heard about the notion of biofilms. We know that this is the bacteria and the microbes. And what happens is they dig really deep in that wound bed. They encase themselves with a, a substance which can be secreted. And that's actually the biofilm that is really hard to get rid of. In fact, what the literature tells us, the only real way to get rid of it is through good debridement. And I'm talking about sharp debridement, but other ways that you may be able to achieve it, such as mechanical. So what's important for you all is to assess well and really diagnose the wound because the diagnosis part is what's going to take you on the journey for how to treat it. Now, I've been using Heidi for years. I also use this uh, slide in most of my talks because Heidi stands for history. Do they have um, other comorbidities? What kind of medications are they on? Do they have any allergies? All of that part of the history taking. Then you can examine the wound and you already heard about the Smith and Nephew time and that's where this comes into the examination part of the wound. Do further investigations. Anybody with an ulcer should be having a Doppler ABPI or toe pressures so you can determine if you can safely use compression. Then diagnose the wound and implement the plan. Here's what the stats tell us. So here's the hospital separations up to 2020. And you can see very clearly on the, the screen some very clear areas that need a focus and attention. That is arterial ulcers. They've kind of stayed stagnant. Venous ulcers, however, are starting to uh, escalate. But look at your diabetic foot ulcers, which is the top blue line. They are certainly tracking up, which means we have a higher prevalence of amputations. In fact, there's been lots of research to show that somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer um, has a higher prevalence of an amputation. And in fact, amputations occur around the world every 20 seconds for a diabetic ulcer. Those statistics really do need to change. But when I look at the patients that you see, and it's no wonder the team today have asked me to talk on these topics, this is mainly what the literature tells me you're looking at. Cuts and grazes, burns, skin tears and ulcers. And for the purpose of today, I'm just going to touch on the top three to um, make sure that we can finish you all on time and get you back to your every day. So minor cuts and grazes I can really achieve within one slide because it just comes down to the basics, wearing your PPE, providing basic uh, first aid, cleansing the wound with what we call tap, uh, potable tap water, which means that if you can drink the water, you can safely put it onto these types of wounds. The real trick here is to get out any gravel or rocks or debris that may be in that wound, because if we fail to do that part, that's when we see grazes and minor cuts go wrong. Um, antiseptics may damage the skin and slow the healing. So we've certainly gone away for the purpose of cuts and grazes with using those types of products. Pat it dry with gauze and apply a sterile adhesive dressing. And you've heard from Smith and Nephew today some of their products. And obviously advise the customer to seek out further advice if it's not healing within a week. And look for signs such as excess redness, heat, pain or exudate. Burns I do want to spend a little bit more time on because they can be rather complex. And in order to take you through maybe some of the minor burns you might see, I want to take you on the journey of the different types. Now, this is the part of my presentation. You are going to see wound pictures. I ask you, please don't take photos of these screens, but also be mindful some of them are graphic. So the first wound uh, burn type that I want to show you today is what we term as a scold. They are mainly superficial. They are often for um, occur within the very young and elderly, and they're often from things like tea, coffee, or in the shower that was too hot. Recently in the ED, we're seeing more presentations, things like two minute noodles, they're dangerous, stop eating them, <laughs> cups of soup, hot oil, hair removal wax. I have a lot of ladies come into the ED where they've burnt, say, their, their sides of their neck from their, their irons that they use on their hair. The one on the screen that you're seeing today, the photo, that is from a hot oil poured on the back um, at work uh, because of the machinery this gentleman was using. Now, obviously, you're not going to see that extent of a wound come into your GP practice, but you may get the follow-up from the hospital once they've discharged to provide the treatment afterwards. 
The other one I want to show you, the next burn type is flames. So it's mainly deep to partial thickness of the skin, generally teenagers. And the reason is, is because they have a tendency to be more of the risk takers. So the gentleman, the young boy on the screen uh, was lighting candles and it was quite intoxicated and they actually exploded and caused him to have a flame burn. These are some that you may start seeing in the GP practice world, and that's what I hear a lot from my colleagues who work in that area. And this is what we call a contact burn. So commonly from irons, oven doors, exhaust pipes. The one on the left hand side of the child's hand, that's where mum and dad has actually opened up the oven to take something out and put it on the, the, the bench top and the child's come along and touch the open door and burnt their hand. The one on the right hand side is a child that's gone running up to those coil uh, heaters and laid straight over the top and sustained the burns. So contact burns we see a lot in children. The next one, and this isn't a photo of mine, this is just from the internet, but this is a chemical burn, often from alkaline acid or phosphorus. In this case, this was a caustic soda burn. Electrical burns, so you can see the different voltages. Obviously, lightning is the most extreme, but um, we do see a lot of these present to the ED, and then we actually send them off to the GP for follow up and further treatment. So the picture in uh, the first picture on your left is a child who put a fork into electrical power point, and the one on the right is a child who actually bit into a Christmas light and sustained some burns to his lower lip. The friction burns, um, we do see a lot of these in GP practice, but certainly not the one on the left. That was a gentleman that was dragged underneath a car. But the one on the right, I do get a lot of phone calls from GP practices around what's the treatment because the child's put their hand on a treadmill as mum or dad's been running and sustained a burn. Um, they do have varying depths and often they are deep partial thickness. Here's some of the ones that you probably see regularly, and that is our uh, what we call radiation burn. So whether it be a sunburn, laser or radiotherapy, they're mainly superficial. So the one on the left is more of an extreme sunburn and the one on the right is a radiotherapy, uh, a radiation treatment that a patient was having. They're really difficult to treat because often they're in really difficult parts of the body and it's hard to get a dressing on. Here's a great um, little tip that I offer you all today. Take a photo of this if you wish. This is the therapeutic guidelines. I just like the way they've laid it out. It shows you the burn depth, how they present, how to treat it, and the healing time frame. And what I would say around time frames is it's really, really important to treat your burn within 24 to 48 hours because that's the crucial time for an infection risk. There are different depths to a burn and I'll just show you that quick uh, slide just so that you can see the, the varying depths when it comes to a burn in terms of the skin layers. And I'm sure you've all heard about the rules of nine. We know that the patient's palm of their hand represents 1%. So what you do is you have a look at their palm of their hand and work out where their burn is as to how much percentage that burn is. I show you this slide because you can see how different burns look in terms of other types of wounds. So you can see day one, day two, and by day five, if we just seen that without knowing day five was an actual burn, we might say that that needs debridement. But on a burn, it probably doesn't. So they can really vary how they look. The management, what we know is that around 90% of burn injuries don't necessarily have to go to hospital, that we can treat them outside a hospital setting. The pure aim is to stop the burning process and cool the burn down. And that means running tap water. And that's the key to all your patients. Stop sitting in a bath and, and tell your patients to please use running tap water from anywhere from 20 minutes up to three hours. You wanna get them also to stop using things like butter, ice, toothpaste, yellow mustard. I see ice being placed on burns more often than not. And we have certainly gone away from using things like flamazine because it's no longer recommended. It is cytotoxic, it can be painful, and it does require frequent application. When it comes to hospital, we recommend, well, not me personally, but what the burns uh, uh, unit has recommended is burns over 10% using your rule of nines for adults or 5% for children. Also, if the genitalia, face, 
or palms are affected, they should go to hospital. And if you are sending a patient to hospital and don't have the appropriate dressing, simple things like cling wrap work wonders. And I will often place cling wrap on somebody who I'm shipping off to hospital for treatment. And it depends obviously how, how big that is. And obviously you wanna consider pain relief. Examples of dressing are on the screen for you, but what I would say is if you have a deeper burn, it is crucial to get a silver dressing on straight away. And the reason is, is because it will slow the risk of any infection. And anyone who knows Professor Fiona Wood, um, she's a great colleague of mine, and we often talk about putting that silver on as soon as you can. There is a hospital transfer criteria, which I've already gone through the detail, um, but it does talk about 10% for adults and over 5% of the rule of nines for children, plus the addition of face, neck, hands, the genitalia uh, area as well. So let's briefly touch on skin tears as a, a, a final few slides today and things that you need to consider. I'm always gonna bring you back to some evidence and one of the documents I'd recommend, it's getting a bit old now. I'm hoping that um, they may look at updating this shortly, but it is a great document if you wanna get your hands on it. It's free of charge. Uh, if you just put that into Google, it will come up for you to download. So the question is what, what patients are at risk of skin tears? Well those with immature skin, so the young and the neonates, those with fragile skin, often the elderly over the age of 65, and those who are dependent on others or are critically ill. So other risk factors could also include medications such as steroids. So that's why it's important to have a look at your patient's medications when you're doing an assessment, impaired mobility, poor nutrition and hydration, and manual handling which is why I've got the photos on the screen. These photos have all come from manual handling from clinicians as to how these, uh, these occurred. Uh, the one up the top is your general skin tear. The one down below was a gentleman who trapped his hand in a closing door. And this one here is from a gentleman who was using a lifter to transfer port a uh, patient and because he had a ring on, it actually caught and lifted up uh, that skin flap. So these are certainly over what we would classify as a skin tear, but it's examples of manual handling and jewellery. Uh, causes of skin tears, trauma, falls, manual handling, jewellery and a knock or bump. I would employ you all today that any patient you have that's over the age of 65, when they come into your practice, the first thing I'd love for you all to do is look down and have a look at their shoes because we know that the elderly have a lot of falls, but quite often they're not wearing the appropriately fitting shoes. So providing them some education around that would be fantastic. <laughs> And um, when it comes to assessment and documentation, it is really good to use a classification system. There's two available that most um, health providers are using. That's the STAR classification, as you can see on the screen. What category is it? 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B or 3. And there's also the ISTAP. Now, the reason I haven't put ISTAP, uh, which gives you a category of 1, 2 or 3, on my screen today is simply because if you have any health providers such as aged care or home and community care, they are still using the STAR classification scale. And the reason is, is because their systems are not um, providing the updated ISTAP because it costs millions of dollars to up upgrade those systems, right? So they're still using STAR. But whatever you're using, as long as you're using some classification, that's my key message today. So the management of skin tears, control the bleeding, cleanse the wound. The crucial part for any skin tear is realign that flap and do it as soon as possible. You want to ensure that the viability of that tissue, that flap is going to remain and it can't do that if it's not back in its usual place. And then think about products such as silicon to place and on the actual wound bed. And don't forget the arrow. The arrow is really important because it guides the next practitioner which way to take it off. One of the things that is not recommended for skin tears is things like iodine based products, such as um, inodine, for example. It is not recommended to be putting those products on skin tears. Obviously, you're not going to put film or hydrocolide dressings such as uh, duoderm on these wounds because they're too adhesive. We've certainly gone away from closure strips such as uh, steri strips because we know that people just used to pile them on on top of each other and then it would cause a problem taking them off. And we don't just place gauze over the actual skin tear. 
a great um, article, and I know, again, this is getting a bit older now, but in 2014, Carolyn et al., uh, they did a really large randomised control trial, and all they did in that was applied an emollient cream twice a day to the lower limbs um, over these aged care homes, and their evidence is amazing. They found a 50% decrease in skin tears just by putting an emollient on twice a day. So what I would encourage you all to do is talk to your patients to ensure that that's what they do. Now, when it comes to skin tears, if everything I've told you you've tried and you've got nothing else, you don't know what else to do, my only advice to avoid further skin tears is to use bubble wrap because at this stage, it makes it very, very difficult. My final uh, message to you all is think about referral pathways. If you have some complex wounds and you do need extra support, you've obviously got GPs within your practice, but do you have a wound specialist you can contact? Because even in the Royal Commission into Aged Care, the recent announcement that Wounds Australia has done an amazing job at getting across the line, you would have heard about it, the consumable scheme that Wounds Australia worked with the department to set up the framework. Um, you need to have access and everywhere, all the documents state you need access to a wound specialist. And remember, when in doubt, always get it checked out. And if you're wondering if you don't have a wound specialist in your area, feel free to take a picture of this screen. Uh, wound Rescue, my company, we do offer referral pathways, both telehealth and face to face. So we do go into patients' homes. We offer loads of education, webinars, masterclasses. We can come on the job and work with you. And this year, at the start of the year, we launched our Chat Your Way program whereby if you subscribe to Wound Rescue, you can actually chat with a wound specialist uh, six days a week from 8am to 8pm and ask any wound questions that you need to for your patients to help you. My take home messages are hard to heal wounds are a silent epidemic, so refer early. Assess and diagnose correctly. Think about the skin to prevent um, any wound from happening. And again, I'm gonna say refer early. And my final tip to you all is never ever give up because wound care is very challenging. But if you think about your patient on the other end, they just want it gone. So and that's why we do what we do every day. So with that, I thank you all very much for your time. And I will now hand back over to the team medical team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hayley, and, and that was brilliant. And we see some questions coming through, but I think everybody has been too busy taking it all in uh, because that was fabulous. But the team has gathered a few questions. So have a sip of water, Hayley and Emma. Great to see you ready. I'm going to just start throwing questions your way. So first one, is biofilm in all wounds? Great question. So, um what the, we've known about biofilms uh, for a very long time. In fact, if you go to your local dentist, uh, they will tell you you've always had biofilms on your teeth. What we know in the wound side of things is over the last eight years, we've really been investing time and research into this very topic because we know it will delay wounds. There are some suggested articles that are saying that, yeah, majority of wounds will have biofilms, but it's your hard to heal or your chronic wounds, so those that are not healing within four to six weeks, that definitely have them. It is very clear in the evidence that those that are taking a delayed approach to healing do have biofilms. Beautiful. And now I will literally give you questions and we do a quick, you know, question answer one. When do you typically see referrals from general practice? Uh, I have relationships with a number of G and my team, not just me, um, of GPs around GP practices around Australia and in New Zealand. We will often get contacted when wounds are just not healing and you've tried everything you can. Um, I always say it's always a, a better if you can tell us beforehand because we can come on that journey with you and support you. But it's generally wounds that are not healing or those that are going for potential amputation. Great, thank you. Question, I was wondering how come silver dressings are recommended for burns, but not flamazine? Yep, flamazine purely because of the cytotoxic um, approach uh, and also because flamazine, you have to apply it almost daily, so daily dressings. And people are not wanting that because there's also a pain factor. Silver dressings, because you want that immediate antimicrobial effect. So I'm not suggesting you put silver dressings on things like sunburns. It's more for your deeper burns. So if you have a deeper burn, uh, you will find that if you had a recommendation to me, we would recommend straight away silver dressing. 
Beautiful. We've got another handful. I'll keep going. What do you recommend for holding skin flaps in situ if sterile strips are out of fashion? Great, great question. Um, I always, my go-to and my team's go-to is to use silicon dressings because they are soft on the skin. They're not going to pull up that flap when you go to change the dressing. And I understand, steri strips were easy to put on. Um, the other problem with steri strips is because they were often put on top of each other, they didn't allow for the, the breathing in between. But if you want something that mimics that, then some of your silicon dressings that come in just the sheet, so I'm not talking with the foam on it, cut them as though they were mimicking steri strips. I do that all the time. Beautiful. What skin emollients do you recommend? Yep, I knew that question would come up. Um, there are a number on the market. One of the things I always say to your to patients is, um, you know, what can you afford? If you can afford the Rolls Royce creams or things like your QV range, fantastic product, but they're a bit more expensive. If you want something more around the price of, say, Sorbeline, things like Abena lotion. Um, epiderm lotion. There's a few on the market. Or just get your patient to pop into the local pharmacy and ask the pharmacist, what pH neutral cream can you offer that I can put on my dry limbs? And then have a look at the range. Fantastic. And for the recording, we'll keep going at this speed. Are Mebulex border dressings, silicone foams alone, not okay for skin tears? Uh, is the question, are they okay for skin tears? Yeah, them alone, metal exported dressings alone, are they not okay for skin tears? No, they're fine. Uh, again, okay. you've got your silicon and you've got your foam. So the silicon in that type of dressing that you've recommended, uh, it actually um, is soft on the skin, won't peel it off, and it's the foam that will actually capture, capture the fluid coming out and hold it in place. Great. Foam dressings are so much kinder on fragile skin, but I often find patients can't access them or it's cost prohibitive. Are there alternatives? Well, there's a, a couple of alternatives. Um, yes, there's the silicon, just the silicon alone, again, not with the foam. Um, access is an issue. We're currently working, if I put my Wounds Australia hat on, we're currently working with the Pharmacy Guild at the moment as to how we can get some of these products into the pharmacy. And of course, I, I've briefly touched on the consumable scheme, which we will now work with the department as to what products are available and how we make them accessible. So I understand there are challenges. Uh, if people uh, join with uh, Wound Rescue, we also provide dressings as well, but there's also looking at your distributors. You know, Do they have what you need to purchase when you're ready to purchase? And things like Team Medical. I mean, I, I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't said Team Medical, I need this product and they have it. And if they haven't, they source it. So that's another option. Thank you. So um, a couple of more and we are running out of time. So I think we might actually have to. Um, I'm checking here. There's quite a few on silver dressings, but I know we will do more webinars and we're doing more trainings because I can see them. They keep coming through now and we do respect your time and know that we want to be out of here in, in three minutes time. So thank you can so I, much for all the questions. I, you know, we will a, keep answering. Yeah. Can I make a quick suggestion? Go I'm sure it. you're all going to get a survey. My advice would be if there are particular questions that you're wanting me to answer or whoever is going to come back and do another talk, if it's just on silvers, I can do a whole session on silver dressings, for example. So drop it into the survey so the team, medical team, know what to do with, with what your needs are. Perfect, because we're asking, what would you like to know more about? Love it. Thank you so much, Haley. Thank you, Emma, you know, for making this possible today. And we'll literally wrap up with just sharing that over the coming months, we are hosting more full day wound care classes. So not 20, 30 minutes with Haley, but a full day uh, with Haley. It is Sydney, Gold Coast um, and um, Brisbane. So click or go into our event page or click the QR code there for more information. And now we'll go to the survey, which I really encourage all of you to just stay with us for one minute. QR code that one, or you will have the survey link in the chat as well. And please just take one minute to complete. It helps us improve. And yes, give us ideas to what else you would like to learn about. And while you're all, you can continue doing the survey while we stop the recording and wrap this up. So if you make sure you just click the link for the survey or get the QR code working, then you're safe, even if the clock goes past the, the next minute. While you're doing that, I just really want to say thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Emma. 
you know, great presentation, so much information in a very condensed time. We, we really appreciate that. So any of you watching this, follow our event page, jump on to all the education we have. And tomorrow you will get an email from us at Team Medical with a link to recording where you can stop each slide and spend five minutes on each one of them uh, if you want. And there will be the PDF um, to your certificate as well uh, on that email. So. Um, Feel free to continue filling out the survey. We really appreciate. Um, thank you all for your time. Have a lovely Wednesday.